Hey guys, real quick before the video starts, I wanted to reach out and remind you that we have the all new Ammo Pivot bottle coming out pretty soon, but I do need your help. If you can go to the link down below in the description and sign up for the Kickstarter campaign, we only have a few days left uh, to help us sort of fund the project and be able to get these triggers to market. So if you haven't done it already, please go and check it out. As always, thank you so much for your support and enjoy the episode. What's up guys? On today's episode, we're working on this beautiful 1980 Porsche 911. As you can see, there's a ton of orange peel in the paint. So today we're gonna to be talking about how that happens and how to remove it with my special guest, Jason Rose from Rupes USA. Okay, first off, thank you for being here. I know uh, you flew in, we have a couple of cars to do, and this is uh, one of them, a really important car. This is covered completely in orange peel. So first things first, explain what orange peel is and then how it occurs on a car that's been repainted that seems to look pretty good when it comes out of the booth and then sometime later, it, it doesn't look as good. It looks like you can surf on these waves, as they say. Right, so there's bumps in the paint. That's mm -hmm. what that orange peel is. The thing that happens with a repainted car. Like this one. Yeah. The paint comes out of the gun wet. It hits the surface and then at some point it dries. So solvent is the carrier for the solids. The solids is the paint and the solvent carries the paint to the surface. What happens is the solvent evaporates out and the paint settles a bit. Now during that process of it settling down, the paint could get texturized because it's literally shrinking down. Okay, so now that we've identified that it's uh, orange peel, how do we take it out? Well, we literally are going to be removing some paint. So the, the peaks and the valleys that exist in the texture, we're going to be knocking off the peaks. So that's how you repair this. So it involves some sanding, and then it involves some machine polishing. But we're first going to measure the paint thickness to understand our baseline thickness that we're dealing with. And then after that, we're going to do a film disc sanding procedure that will chop off the peaks of this texture, followed by a foam disc sanding procedure, and then one or two steps of machine polishing. And then it should look flat as glass. Step one is to wash the vehicle if necessary, and in our case, since it's stored in a museum, it doesn't really need it. On the other hand, we do need to remove or break up any wax that may be on the surface that might cause the sanding disc to ride over the paint instead of on top of it. To do this, Jason and I are using a 50-50 mixture of isopropyl alcohol to remove any basic layer of protection. Next, we remove the badges, the front intake, we taped up the trim, the door handles, and all the tight spots. Then we covered up the wheels to avoid them getting covered in sanding residue over the next two days. The first step is to dry sand with a 1500 grit film disc to level the texture. Now this step can be done wet or dry based on the type of sandpaper you're using. Now in our case, step number one is dry because the disc we're using is designed to be only used for dry sanding. So make sure you pay attention to the particular disc you're using. Okay, before we get too far down the path, let's keep in mind there are two places where people tend to get into trouble with these film discs. Number one, the discs are designed to remove layers of paint. If we see orange peel, let's say in our brand new car, and you want to remove it with a film disc, you can do it. But let's just say in this scenario that you do remove it, it looks absolutely perfect, you're thrilled, you've actually thinned out the clear coat, jeopardizing the integrity of your paint's protection. So in theory, again, if let's say six months later, you have a scratch in your car and you wanna remove it, you don't have any room to play anymore. You've removed all of, or most of the clear coat. So keep that in mind. Red flag number two is people tend to choose a heavier grit than is actually needed to remove the texture. This is where a test spot is absolutely critical. You must use the least aggressive step when texture leveling. So sort of think to yourself, what's the finest grid paper I can use to remove the texture? As opposed to just hitting it with a bazooka and leveling it, you're gonna remove too much clear coat. Okay, lastly, if you're watching this video and you wanna sand your car, the truth is there's way more reasons to not sand your car than there are to actually do it. The reason we're doing it here is because this particular car was poorly repainted years ago and there's a ton of paint on the car, as you can see with our paint depth gauge. Most average factory paint jobs can range anywhere from three to six mil. And this one is reading in the low 20s on the alchometer, so we have plenty of paint to sand and it makes it a perfect candidate for the job. 
Okay, with all the disclaimers aside, it's now time to get started. And because we have multiple people working, we're able to simultaneously do three inch sanding for the edge work and six inch sanding for flat, wide open spaces. To set up the machines, we're using foam interface pads under the film discs to minimize excessive edge cutting and to minimize pigtail marks during the leveling process. Your goal here is to see the glossy sort of textured or orange peely paint converted to a flat appearance with white dust if you're dry sanding or white liquid if you're wet sanding. This white powder or liquid is the clear coat material coming off the surface as you're sanding. After a few passes, wipe off the residue and then inspect the paint to make sure you remove the texture. Obviously, if you haven't, then repeat the same step until you're satisfied with the amount of leveling. Likewise, I know a lot of you guys are gonna be asking, but it's a huge challenge for me to tell you how many discs you're gonna use on a particular project because paint hardness obviously varies from car to car. So just pay attention to when the disc slows down its rate of sanding. The way that you're gonna know that is it's cutting less, which creates less sanding residue. So then when you see that, it's now time to switch to a fresh pad. Another thing to keep in mind is what we call the sanding rule of thumb. This is where you leave a thumbnail size space unsanded around all the edges for safety. Before you start a project, you have to ask yourself, does this have to be perfect or just much better? Is it a daily driver or is it flat bedded to car shows? Here's why. Properly sanding edge work takes hours, even days longer to complete a project to avoid burn through or just the tedious nature of working in tight spots alone. In this case, it's daily driven by the owner of the Audrain Museum, so we left a thumbnail size space around the edges to avoid days of unnecessary work. Once we finish with 1500, then we use 2000 grit foam back disc to refine the previous step of the 1500. Where the 1500 disc is focused on sanding the very top parts of the orange peel, the foam back disc, the 2000 disc, are designed to sand in between the peaks and valleys, sort of contouring to the paint and leaving a much more refined surface, which prepares the paint for the next step of compounding and polishing. Now, unlike the film discs that can be used dry or they can be used wet, the foam back discs of any brand, they're specifically designed to be used wet or what we call damp. In this case, we use the spray bottle filled with water and we give a light mist to the disc and to the paint, which is why we refer to it as damp and not necessarily wet. Just like before, you should also see some white liquid from the previous step because you're removing material again, just at a slower rate. Once you're done with the section, you can really see the difference between the 1500, which is in the middle of the hood here, that doesn't show any of the above lights, and then the 2000 foam disc on the driver's side of the hood that is beginning to show a little bit of the outline of the lights as we get closer to a flat and reflective paint surface. Okay, now here's where it gets fun. Once the entire paint has been leveled with 1500 and then refined with 2000 grit, it's now time to remove the remaining haze with a Rupes 21 blue coarse compound and the blue DA wool pad on speed four. Now the benefit of the 2000 grit foam disc in this entire process is that you can actually use a dual action polisher to remove the installed haze, where in the years past, you'd actually have to use a rotary polisher, compound, wool pad, etc., to get the sanding marks out of the finish. After each section, be sure to blow out the pad and then apply two small dots for the next area. Likewise, use a three inch pad and machine in the tight spots as needed. Next, for the second step polish, we use the white pad and Uno Pure Ultra Finishing Polish. It's called pure because it doesn't leave any solids or materials behind to prepare the paint for the protection phase. After the last step refinement was done, we protected the freshly restored surface with Reflex Pro, which made the paint absolutely pop, before replacing the badge, grill, wipers, removing the tape, cleaning the windows, and adding mud moisturizer to the tires and the rubber trim. 
One quick way to measure the clarity of the paint is to look at words on a wall uh, on the other side of the room, let's say, while looking into the paint. In this case, we looked at the ammo shield and read the words on it, and they were nearly perfect, and the distinctness of the image was remarkable after the job. Well guys, after two days, the paint looks absolutely phenomenal. The difference between before and after is huge. Hopefully the camera's picking it up. You can really see it in the hexagrid lights and all the lights around here, uh, stunning. So the recap here is we did 1500, 2000, and then we used the Rupes new DA system, the compound and polish, yes? yes. Absolutely insane. I'm gonna be doing a couple of different videos on that uh, product line as well. Specifically on the one behind us right there, a little bit of a sneak preview, uh, the Glickenhaus boot. But really, uh, the only thing that's left to do is to take this back to the Aldrain Museum. Uh, huge thank you to them, by the way, for letting us uh, work on this amazing car. And there's going to be a lot more coming up uh, from them as well. So make sure you check out their website. So only thing left to do, like I said, let's get in the car and drive it. We need to make sure that the paint is OK. <laughs> <laughs> After our little joyride, the team from the Audrain Museum arrived to pick up the freshly sanded 911 for the owner, Nick. Now, at the same time, the Remac arrived at the studio for some detailing, and of course, it started to rain, so getting the 911 in the trailer without getting it wet would be the next challenge. So we moved the trailer as close to the door as we could, and Jason, dressed like he's in the witness protection program, along with my neighbor Steve's dad and I, held pieces of plastic to shield the Porsche from the rain as we pushed it in. But, of course, there was one issue. Uh, Jason, go ahead. Dripping. Got it. We're in. Right I in. give you one job. your walk of shame. Look at the drippies. Look at the drippies. Go ahead. Give the man one job. Yeah, give, give the short guy the job. The <laughs> you see, we had it perfect and it was all funneling in. <laughs> With the 911 all packed up, we arrived in Rhode Island to present the restoration to Nick. Wow. This tail has never looked like this. It's amazing. Totally. Everything looks like better than new. To see my full interview with Nick and the Car by Car tour, subscribe uh, to the Ammo Studio channel for more behind the scenes footage. Looking back, Lamborghini.